Hello, thank you for joining us today as we present on reflective practice for academic librarians. My name is Eric Bradley and I am joined here by my colleague Ruth Spoonar. We are both information fluency coordinators for the Private Academic Library Network of Indiana or PALNI. PALNI is a library consortium of 23 private colleges and universities located in the state of Indiana. Our consortium began with a shared library management system and has now expanded to include other everyday aspects of library service, including our work and reference, instruction, and outreach. In our work for Palney, Ruth and I support public service librarians by developing workshops, conducting user research, and leading task forces on topics such as instruction, assessment, and librarian faculty collaboration. Today, we're going to focus on three different types of self-reflection with different examples for each. We'll give you ideas for how to incorporate self-reflection into your work life and hopefully we'll inspire you a bit. The first type of self-reflection we're going to focus on is immediate reflection. We're defining this as reflection that takes place within one hour of the activity in question. You could probably push that out to one day, but as we all know, our memories of events get fuzzy almost immediately. So the sooner you reflect, the better. Before we jump into some examples of immediate reflection, I wanna take a higher level look at reflective practice. I'm going to define reflective practice as intentionally reflecting on experiences in order to grow and develop. There are lots of models for this, but this is one I like, it's called the Gibbs model, and I'm gonna walk you through applying it to a library instruction session. So we're gonna start in the cycle with description. Oh, whoops description. Uh, first, you're going to write a summary of what happened. This is just logistics and does not contain any analysis at this stage. You're going to focus on who, what, where, when sorts of questions. Who did you meet with? What preparations did you make? Where did you meet with the class? When did the class meet? Uh, there are lots and lots of questions that can fall under logistics, and this is where you're going to summarize them. Once you've had a whole description written out, then you're going to move into the first stage of reflection, which is feelings. Think about how you felt about what happened in the instruction session. What feelings did the session invoke for you? And how do you feel about the session now that a few minutes or an hour or a day has passed? Once you uh, sit with your feelings for a minute, then you're gonna move into evaluation. This is where you consider the session as if you were an outside observer. What went right? What went wrong? And did you meet your learning objectives? Once you evaluate your uh, instruction session, you move on to analysis. This is where you ask yourself why. Why did the session invoke those feelings? Why did the session go well? Why did it go poorly? You can ask others uh, to help you analyze. Uh, you can consult professional literature to help you analyze. Uh, you just sort of sit there until you can figure out why things happened. Once you have your analysis done, then you move to the conclusion. This is where you pull everything together. You're going to make sure you have clear written notes. Uh, you're going to summarize what you've learned and you're going to determine what changes you'd like to make. Do you need to develop your teaching skills in one area? Do you need to ask a colleague for help? Uh, you could take a class, you could consult professional literature, or maybe there's a lot of things that are going right and you just need to make a really small tweak. Uh, whatever it is, go ahead and lay that out for yourself. Then move into the action plan session section, take your notes from your conclusion and make the plan. We all know that we can sit around and reflect and analyze until the cows come home, but if you don't make an action plan, nothing's going to change. So what are you going to put on your calendar? What are you going to put on your to-do list? Um, what are you going to actually make happen? So what I like with this model is that you can focus on and describe what happened and then focus and improve for next time. You could use this model for literally anything, and we're going to use it a couple of times today. Um, so I've just used instruction as an example. The writing method that I've used for immediate reflection is a reflective journal approach. Uh, I think the literature on this topic makes a really interesting distinction between a journal and a diary and a log. Uh, so we're going to pretend we're middle schoolers for a minute. Hopefully that's not too traumatic for you all. Um, but uh, a log lets you record events. So if I was going to write a log uh, for a day in middle school, it might read, got up, put on my favorite outfit, walked to school, had a big presentation in my lit class, took the bus home, and ate Subway for dinner. Now a diary is your emotional reaction to events. So if I was going to write in my middle school diary for the same day, 
ah, the cute boy in math class talked to me today. He's so dreamy. And then of course you write your name and his name and hearts and you know, you scribble as middle school girls do. I don't know what middle school boys write in their diary. Um, but a journal combines the two. So a journal entry for that day might read, woke up this morning super worried about my lit class presentation, but aced it. Could not find my favorite outfit, but mom finally came through. Missed the bus in the morning, but managed to catch it in the afternoon. Dad knew I had a bad day, so he got a subway for dinner. So glad it's Friday. So to do reflective practice, you need the journal entry. The log doesn't allow you the space to reflect on the activities, as we saw in Gibbs' model, and the diary doesn't contain enough facts and reason to allow you to grow and improve. I learned about this practice at a professional event in 2018, and afterwards I decided I wanted to make my own reflective teaching journal. I set up the following parameters for myself. First, I would write an entry immediately after the class. Uh, if possible, I do it in the classroom that I taught in, since, as you guys know, as soon as you go back to your office, someone has a question, someone uh, asks you something, and all of a sudden you've forgotten what happened in the class. Um, and when I reflected, I would answer the following questions, which you can see on the screen. What, are the best, what was the best part of the session? What was the worst part of the session? Is there anything I should remember if I teach this class again? And is there anything I need to share with or follow with the instructor about? Um, and the third thing I decided was that I would keep the journal in a Google Doc, that way I could access it from any computer, no matter where I was doing library instruction, or if there was no computer, I could even access it from my phone. I faithfully kept up with this practice for that academic year. Because I was downsized from DePauw in spring of 2019, I didn't get to use the log for more than one year, but I really do think that these notes would have been helpful the next year. A lot of classes I have, I have multiple years, so I would have been able to go back and look at my notes and uh, reflect on how those classes went. Here's another example of a teaching journal. Um, this one is from an article by Elizabeth Tompkins. I think it's fairly similar to mine. Uh, she's got the class, the date, the time, the instructors, all that uh, logistical summary. Uh, she has a little background. And then she uses the class details section to go ahead and add reflection right in there. Uh, so you can see some of the description of the students, some hostile reactions, etc. Um, the difference between hers and mine is that she adds this post-semester reflection. So uh, the post-semester reflection is a really important part of the process. When you create a journal, you need to make sure you build in rules about when you'll look at it again. Are you going to, as she did, look at it at the end of the semester? Are you going to look at it at the end of the year? Only before you return to a specific class, which was my plan. Um, all of these are totally valid ways to use your journal as long as you uh, actually come back to what you do. And of course, both of these examples used a type document of some form, but your journal can be in any format that works best for you. I've had several colleagues who've carried notebooks around with them, and I know a lot of people who have a whole stack of journals with a specific purpose for each. If you're one of those people, go that route for your reflective journal. One of my friends was recently telling me about his journal, which has 365 pages, one for each day of the year, and then each page has five sections so that you can write in it for five years in a row, and you're always seeing what happened to you on that day a year ago. Now, I don't think that this would work well for an instruction journal, because we don't usually meet with the same class on the same day, but if you were just going to reflect on your work in general or on some other practice, uh, that style might work really well. So if you wanna set up a reflective teaching journal for yourself, uh, here are some questions you could ask yourself. When are you going to do this? My example, I said I wasn't gonna leave the classroom. Uh, what format will you use? We just discussed all of those. And then we've got a list here of some questions you can ask yourself. And you, you notice there are some here that I didn't ask. You don't wanna add so many questions that you won't get it done. So you wanna come up with a number that is an easy number for you to answer um, and the ones that matter to you. I knew for me that I really wanted the share with or follow up with the instructor one because how many times when we're walking out of the room does an instructor say, hey, do you guys have X? or something like that, and you're walking out of the room and you don't have a place to note it, and then you remember a week later and you feel bad. So I wanted to make sure that I had that specific question, um, but it can vary really widely based on what it is that you want to achieve. So now I'm going to turn it over to Eric, and he's going to talk about another way to use immediate reflection. Thanks, Ruth. Um, I want us to now look at another example of immediate reflection in practice. So along with my work at Palney, I spend the majority of my time as a reference and instruction librarian at Goshen College, which is a small liberal arts college in the Palney Consortium. Our reference desk provides a research assistance and writing tutoring to our student body. And we work closely with our campuses 
Academic Success Center in doing this. Uh, we tracked patron interaction in this Google form, as you can see on the screen here. While the questions do not explicitly reflect the Gibbs model, uh, many elements are included. The form elements provide a who, what, when, where, why description of the event, as well as space to include personal feelings. Um, for our writing tutoring sessions, we also track student names and courses, which from like the reference side and patron privacy is a little unusual for a desk like this, but uh, this is standard for writing tutoring. Um, the best part of this form that you see here is not what it contains, however, but that each form submission is shared by email that you can see on this slide here to everyone that works at our reference desk. Here we are able to immediately see all the interactions happening at the desk. Um, this collaborative reflection allows us to see the ebbs and flows of requests, track challenging assignments and um, maybe challenging patrons and help alert our academic success center colleagues of students who are really struggling academically. While looking at this data annually is helpful and important, you know, which we do that kind of June, July thinking, having this information immediately allows us to have a shared understanding of what is happening at the desk and how to handle particular questions and students. Uh, during our switch to remote references last year, this form was even more important as those usual kind of water cooler style conversations were non-existent. Um, so we were extremely uh, helpful to be able to have this and be able to use this in our daily work. The next form of self-reflection we're gonna talk about is delayed reflection. My favorite form of everything we're gonna talk about, my favorite form of self-reflection is a delayed reflection technique called Five on Friday. Five on Friday is a reflective practice where you share five things about your week with a small group of colleagues via an email thread. We started this practice in fall of 2018 after we heard about this practice from Susan Adams, who's an education professor at Butler University. After a few groups petered out of the process, we've ended up with a few Palney colleagues participating. Sometimes it's just Eric and I who write them and sometimes the whole group will chime in and occasionally throw a meme or a gif in there. But what I really realized after a few months of doing this reflective practice was what type of work it was that I found valuable, what I enjoyed and what I focused on. What was it that always showed up every single Friday in my reflection? So this reflection caused Eric and I to start our own business in January of 2019, right before I got the news in March that I'd been downsized from my job at DePauw. All my reflection time had already put a new career track in place and it allowed me to embrace such a massive change in my life. It's also developed my relationships with those in my reflection group and become a solid record of my work. I often say that Susan Adams changed my life and I really do credit her in this practice with that. I asked my colleagues to share their thoughts and my colleague Megan said, Ruth's five on Friday reflection exercise has been one of the best strategies I've implemented to identify symptoms of burnout and respond accordingly. Not only do I get feedback on projects, but it's been a great tool for me to see what has and will be my top priorities for the coming week. I find five on Friday helpful in forcing me to think back to what I actually did during this past week. Uh, it's so easy to for forget, right? So I begin by looking at my uh, calendar for the week and making note of the key events that took place. Oftentimes a major and time consuming event early in the week have, I have already forgotten about. And five on Friday allows me to remember and then reflect why this was so important or not so important. This also forces me to look at the good in my work as so often it is easy to remember the what with the bad, what didn't go right, and to only think of the negative. Um, having to think through four positive things during the week and uh, only being allowed to do one downer uh, provides for an opportunity for gratitude and to focus on the good work that is happening. So I'm gonna show you some examples. So here's one of our five on Friday threads. My point number two says, whenever I start to discuss user research with people, I'm fully reminded of how much expertise Eric and I have gained over the last six years. I think it's my favorite part of my job, other than Camp Rio, of course. I wrote a section of our new Palney website manual about personas yesterday, which prompted this musing. 
or my colleague Joelle said, I'm enjoying being on my first official task force. I really enjoy the momentum of working meetings and find myself feeling much more productive afterwards. And Eric said, now that the semester is over, I poured over easy proxy logs and various ways to use easy parse. I already used the data for a collection development decision. So here are the five on Friday rules. You can see rules are in quotes because <laughs> this is a reflective practice. It doesn't have rules. Um, but this is what Susan told us, uh, that you could write up to five things about your week. Only one, as Eric said, is supposed to be negative. Uh, the things can be a mix of professional and personal, uh, depending on your comfort level with the group. Our group is pretty comfortable with each other, so we probably have at least one personal thing per week. Uh, again, the things should take the form of a journal entry, and then anyone can start the email thread on a Friday. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed over time is that five things is a lot for people. Uh, so sometimes we get people who will send one or maybe they'll send three. What I really like about five is sort of what Eric was saying earlier. Uh, it makes you think past the first easy ones and actually gets you into contemplation. But just like I said about the rules, uh, reflection is supposed to be supportive and strengthening. It's not supposed to stress you out. Uh, so if you do this practice, you don't need to stress over coming up with five things. The point is to get you reflecting. So uh, if you do one thing, great. If you do three things, great. If you do five things, great. If you do no things, that's okay. Do it next week. Uh, so it's, it's how many things are not relevant as much as it's the writing of the list that's powerful. So now I want to uh, talk about a different type of delayed reflection, and um, this will be about those infamous annual reports. So many of us have to write annual reports for our supervisors, and I can hear the groans now. I kind of have that in the back of my mind. Um, many of these reports are never read, and if so, only because um, they are read um, in times of um, institutional crisis and oftentimes just read in between the lines, right? But if you have to write one, um, it's important to capitalize on the opportunity. Um, as I like to say, don't let a good crisis go to waste. So at, um, consider at the beginning of this process of compiling data and writing goals, whether they are goals written in the report or not, um, through the lens of the Gibbs model that we looked at earlier, and I'll walk through this uh, in these next pieces here. Um, here is an example of what they may look like. So I want to begin at the top here, and we'll work our way around, as um, Ruth did for the instruction example. Uh, with description, uh, begin by compiling the data. This is um, even beyond the raw numbers for reporting. This is a great opportunity to look back at your assessment data. I'll also consider here looking back at your various immediate reflection forms for this practice, um, as well as helping uh, refresh in your mind what happened. I always find it fascinating to look back at this immediate reflection data, especially for the more emotionally heated notes, which moves us to feelings. Um, while looking back at our feelings at a later time is really, um, it's just good to look back at our feelings later on, especially after them moment has cooled down. Why was I so upset or why was I so apathetic during that particular moment? Um, was it the situation or was it the way that I handled it or was it kind of a bit of both? I always like to compare also the feelings that have stuck with me alongside with the ones I had otherwise forgotten. Maybe that gnawing one of a student that fell through the cracks at one. Why did that stick with me and why did this other one not? Um, as we move uh, onward um, and we are looking at this data and we've looked at the feelings, evaluate the data, uh, make note of the successes and the challenges, um, and look at the trends from previous years of uh, what stands out. As we move to analysis, take time to think through why things were successful or not. Of course, we'll all say because of COVID this year, but Really, that take a step further and consider your practices. Um, don't just kind of check this year off and make an excuse, but really see, take advantage of it. Um, next, move to a con your conclusion. Um, what do you now need to celebrate in your annual reports? And whether you report it or not in the annual report, um, what are the things that can be worked on and maybe some of the, the challenges that you can, you can do? And then the most important part, because if you don't do it, it won't happen, is the action plan. 
uh, make this list of goals for the coming year. And with a thoughtful look of the year's data, this is a great chance to incorporate this into your goals. And again, you can write the goals that you want your supervisor to see. And you can also write those goals that, you know, what's the things you really want to work on yourself? That don't feel shy to, you know, take this opportunity for some of your honesty here. Um, if you're required to spend the time to do this, a lens like this can provide helpful feedback to help you grow in your craft. The third form of self-reflection we are calling focused reflection. This is done occasionally. This isn't even um, on like a particular pattern and can fit well, although does not have to, into a corporate retreat setting, uh, such as Pownies Camp Rio that I'll mention about in a minute. Focused reflection works by stepping away from normal routines and patterns for an extended period of time to both re-engage earlier forms of reflection as well as develop new ones. Professional retreats can come in many shapes and forms. What is most important about a professional retreat to be successful is to be intentional from the start. So uh, here's a couple of recommendations for a focused reflection. Um, number one, make a goal for the time. This is not a vacation, this is a retreat. So start with this goal in mind to guide your reflection to, to move it forward. Consider focused readings for before and during the retreat. Um, this is a great chance to tackle something larger that you may have not read during the workday and you would never read at home. Um, and also to kind of think through readings outside the library discipline, you know, the ones that come through your email or come into um, to come to your desk, but you're gonna see those regards, but try to pull something outside the discipline. Good readings can help frame and structure your time of reflection. Unplug, relax. Uh, this can be, um, this is the point to do a set apart space. Walk away from technology as much as possible and get as comfortable as is professionally possible. So if that means being able to put on shorts and a t-shirt or whatever is comfortable in a still somewhat professional setting. Uh, the fourth one down is this concept of bringing in outside voices. Um, this can be talking to colleagues outside of your own institution, such as going to professional retreat with professional colleagues at neighboring schools or, or beyond but also with um, those um, even outside of your discipline, bringing in somebody, a professional who can talk about things from a non-library um, angle. Reflection is really key in these times too. Uh, get that journal out. Um, even if you haven't journaled all year and done those immediate refl reflections uh, right now, also reflect with um, those around you. The goal is to kind of step out of this routine. And the last part is to um, incorporate downtime and recreation. In a professional retreat, you're doing a lot of hard work, especially work that you don't normally do. So your brain is, is going to be tired. So make this time to um, go for a walk, talk with friends about nothing, play a game, um, you name it. Ruth and I have said incorporated these suggestions into Pownies professional, ret professional Retreat for Reference Instruction and Outreach Librarians called Camp Rio. For two days, we wear relaxed clothing and head to a camp or retreat center, sometimes with poor internet and poor cell phone coverage, and engage with readings often outside the library literature and with colleagues outside of our library building. Mixed between this hard work is time for crafts, hiking, and lighthearted conversations. So what have we gained from this form of reflection? While immediate reflection is a kind of a gut check of the moment, focused reflection allows for a heart check. How is your day did a work lining up with your larger principles, practices, and priorities? Not having to worry about that student directly in front of you um, can help ask those questions about how best to serve that student when you return later to the office. Other forms of reflection I'd like to share, um, I, uh, I'd like to share two in particular, um, can be really helpful to think through. The first is reflection on personal readings. 
As librarians, I know we all engage in various forms of pleasure reading, even if it's the form of social media articles, maybe those long form internet articles we stumble on. Oh, while what we read for fun really does impact and inform us in so many ways, we often don't take uh, set aside time to consider how this impacts our lives, especially our professional lives. The second piece of reflection I want to recommend is to look back on notes you take while at a conference. So how often do we go to a conference, even a virtual one like this, and then return back to our normal routine, forgetting most of what we listen to? So I try to make a practice of spending time on the Monday after I return from a conference um, and carefully go through the notes that I wrote and then wrote, write summaries of what I um, took away, questions I may have, and then places to follow up, especially if like you're having lunch with somebody and say, oh, I'm gonna email so-and-so, right? I wait till that Monday and, and do that then. I find that this time can often be the most helpful part of a conference. Another form of reflection that Eric and I do is in the form of debriefing meetings. Uh, we plan events, we run usability tests, and we do all sorts of major projects. Anytime we do one, we get together and discuss what went right, what went wrong, and basically we run through the whole Gibbs cycle. These meetings are so valuable. Uh, they help us plan all of our future work. Uh, another thing that my husband and I do is when we take long car trips, he likes to ask me, where do you want your career to be in a year? And what do we need to do to get you there? Or where do you want to be in five years and what do we need to get you there? Uh, what I like about this is, you know, we have two kids, we're in the minutia of life, and this lets us think long term. You know, what is it that, that we're doing? What do we want to make strategic? Uh, think and plan for the future. We've got on our slides here a couple of further reading for you. Um, if you're interested in reading more, this is some of the literature that's inspired us. Uh, and this is where we would pause for questions if we were presenting this to a room full of librarians, but uh, instead we'll invite you to join us for our question and answer session at the ALAO conference, or please feel free to send us an email. Uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts, and thank you so much for listening to our presentation. <laughs>